Welcome to the Two Old Guys Talking Podcast. Today's topic is about life and general philosophy. Here we go. John, when you wake up in the morning, what do you look forward to? I find if I don't have a workflow with something specifically to start doing, that my day is, it, it never goes anywhere. So uh, I, I kind of have to decide the night before what I'm going to be looking forward to the next morning. And then if I, uh, if I don't think of it myself, it'll be on my written to-do list. Right. I create a, a, a to-do list as well that I keep in an online database. It contains like sort of big picture goals. And then I break it down into what I need to do today and in the short term and in the midterm and in the long term. And this I can I keep I can refer to it and it helps me so that I I just don't forget anything. But you're right when when you get up in the morning, it's nice to have a bit of a schedule. Well, I have a routine uh, that uh, I, I follow. No, it just it varies. It's a, I'm a little off routine now. I'm not getting my uh, workouts done first thing in the morning. Like the things that I normally do first thing in the morning, I've put off because I'm so friggin' busy with work. I'd be falling behind and. It's actually a bit of a frustration for me right now. I'm, I've got to get something adjusted here. Okay, so you're you're a busy man. You're in your 60s, and uh, are you generally happy with with life? Are things uh, have things been going at least recently the way that you had hoped that they would? Yeah, I've never. No matter how life has ever gone, I've never been really to complain or blame life. I've always kind of looked at it. What am I doing wrong? And uh, is there anything I can do about it? But uh, yeah, I'm pretty satisfied. I, I don't want to be like disrespectful to people who are struggling right now because of this COVID thing, but it's going a little too good for me. Uh, like I, I'm having a hard time uh, keeping up to the volume of, of work that I've got right now. Right. As I've said, that's, that's what I call a good problem. Yeah, it is a good problem. For me, I, I don't think it's, it's so much about happiness. There's, there are too many sad and stupid things going on in the world, but I would say that overall, I'm, I'm, uh, I guess the word that comes to my mind is content. Uh, I'm sort of happy with my lot in life, you know, despite, uh, you know, numerous, uh, you know, failings in the past, I've managed to, you know, pick myself up and uh, things are going pretty much the way that, uh, that make me happy. You know, I think this whole idea of happy is skewed. That's just not, life is not a Disney movie. You know, maybe what, uh, a word I might prefer is if, you know, are you happy with your life? Um, I would prefer, do you feel challenged? That's, I feel happier when I'm challenged than I do when, I, you know, just, I'm not doing anything. Like, it's basically you're, uh, you're in a rut. That's what, that, that would be the alternative, I would think. Life is hard. I think it's hard for everybody. So this whole concept of happiness, uh, it may have been bastardized a bit with uh, pop culture and the media. That's, that's why I say that I look for, for contentment. It's not to say that everything is going my way. Life is basically how you deal with problems. Yeah, I think we have to be careful when we say that life is hard. Uh, life is heaven on earth for us in North America. Um, yeah. and, and I'm only saying that figuratively speaking, I like, I've never really, uh, like, how do you get your head around the way it is for a lot of people on this planet? Uh, That's right. uh, although, you know, interestingly enough, when you talk about happiness, uh, it is all in uh, parts of the world where they have nothing that rate as being happiest. I would imagine if you're not un being under perse if you're not being persecuted, it's not so much the, uh, the things that you uh, you have or you don't have that contribute to your sense of contentment in life. So uh, there's a lot of people out there that have every reason not to be happy. But interestingly enough, uh, it's it's not tied into uh, what we consider success here in North America. Right. You're right that you know where we are, like you and I, like geographically and at this point in history, it's really never been better for anybody. This is, this is as good as it has ever got. And I think that at least I recognize that fact and I am thankful for it. When you look around the rest of the world and, and you see uh, some, of the, some of the governments that people have to live under, uh, some of the living conditions that people have to live under, uh, it makes you uh, thankful for what you have over here in, in North America.
Right. But you know, something that I think of uh, uh, upon occasion is we've never walked in those shoes. And there are people who have and did and then made it to this environment, like our, in North America and uh, the opportunities that are there. And I often wonder what a, what a miraculous feeling that must be in your head when you know we're theoretically saying we know we have it good. They know how for good a fact they're and can take advantage of it. That must be exciting with all the, the baggage that must come from coming from that kind of ba- background if it was a, you know, a, a background of persecution, that sort of thing. But just the windows of opportunity, the, the I mean, ability. Some people a hard time to get used to it, like waiting for the shoe to drop. Yeah, I think it's, it's that ability to, at least that environment where you can make a mistake and somebody's not going to pull out a gun and shoot you or throw you in jail or, or find some other way to put you down. But, you know, just, just because, uh, because of, of, of that, when I interact with people, I, I make a, a point of cutting them some, a lot of slack because I don't, you know, I don't know exactly what they've come from. I don't know all of their cultural uh, dealings. You know, I, I remember uh, it, sometimes it's a, sty- it's, it's, a, it's a style of communication that people have. I have some friends from Iran and uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the men there, he likes to get very up close and talk to you, like right up to your face. <laughs> yes. And I, I wonder what the heck was going on. And I realized that's just a style of communication from that culture. That's what they do, having done a lot of business uh, both of us having done a lot of business, basically, I, I cut people slack until I think they're they're trying to manipulate me, or I think they're just you know just trying to play games. Yeah, yeah, I understand that it's human nature to be uh, like people who are, are coming here from uh, um, uh, with nothing that are are receiving support for the tax dollars paid by Canadians or Americans or wherever you happen to be come from if you're watching this. It's human nature to feel resentment and go, oh, they just came here for a free ride and they're taking it. I have no worries about that whatsoever. Like I, uh, the vast majority in my experience and overall, no, they, they, they take the, 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 the handout to get a leg going and, and then they never look back. And for whatever few, I mean, again, you know, oh, well, I know somebody. I'm sure you do. But go look for the other ones because uh, they're leaving us in the dust. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, I think it's a question of, uh, of work ethic. I guess one of my, uh, my pet peeves is just how dependent, you know, the average native-born Canadian is dependent uh, and willing to rely on, on the government. Yeah, well, I guess we're going to be learning a little bit about that soon. We're in that uh, time when uh, our government, the Canadian government, has just announced a massive uh, debts accumulated as a result of supporting everybody, it seems, in the, during the COVID-19 crisis. Yes, well, and there's, I think there are a lot of people that are going to need it. My curiosity is, is holy smokes, if they had all that money, what the heck, where is it coming from? Like it just, uh, I'm not saying that people shouldn't get support. I just don't know where the money's coming from to underwrite, you know, everybody's life right now. It's just just coming out of thin air. Question, we put it off to future generations. I know that you have a couple of sons, they're young men. What do you, uh, are you optimistic about their future? Paul, I said this. Uh, as soon as I found out I was going to be a, 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 a dad and I, I love being a dad and I want nothing but the best for my sons, but I predicted that they would be the first generation that would not live the same lifestyle and lifespan that all those that came before. And in the, in recent years there, they're certainly saying, I don't know if they mean lifespan in the way that I did. I, I just don't think, I think the world's going to get pretty dark if some if we don't have some kind of miracle here and so that they're in a much tougher uh, tougher position so yeah i'm it's, i'm not optimistic and i don't think that they're particularly well prepared for it so have you had that sort of conversation this this sort of conversation with them yeah you know paul i can understand asking that question um just put yourself in their shoes they're just not wired to hear that yet just not the way it works. So it's not that I haven't had that conversation or hinted towards it or encouraged them to think in certain lines, but it's, it's just not the way uh, we are wired at that age in our lives. Generally, you're going to have your elders um, 
doing the preparation for you. And then when, uh, uh, when the proverbial shit does hit the fan, hopefully they can take advantage of it and mature into it. Yeah, one of the things that I wanted to ask you during this episode was uh, if you knew then what you know now, what you would have done differently as, as a young man. And uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, since your sons are not, you know, receptive to the sort of thinking uh, along these lines of, of preparation. If you knew then what you know now, what would you have done differently as a younger man? And, and I can tell you from my own personal perspective, John, uh, you know, looking back on it now, I held authority figures in too much esteem. Politicians, people presented as business leaders, you know, too, too, too much respect that wasn't earned. It was all, you know, back as, as a young man, you are much more heavily impressed with a person's image than you are about digging into their actual background and seeing what they're actually uh, seeing right. what they're actually about or thinking even thinking through what they're all about. Then I, I would add like one of my rules of life that uh, something that again I don't believe I would have been able to absorb the message. But this would be the message that I would send to my younger self: is embrace the Pareto principle. Uh, I don't remember his first name was, and that may not be the right uh, Italian uh, pronunciation of his name, but he was an Italian economist. And he did, uh, he was doing some research and found that 80% of the uh, uh, property in Italy was owned by 20% of the Italians. Right. And so that eventually became the 80 20 principle that a lot of people have heard of. And so, and, and in my experience, uh, I think that flies. If, if you have a doctor, you, you have to keep in mind whether it's your doctor, your lawyer, your accountant, uh, whoever it is that is, as you were describing, an authority figure, only 20% of them, 20% of them are doing 80% of the production, th that they are really the, uh, um, the leaders in their field. The others, um, you want to avoid. And, and it's so that, that would be, if I went in with that filter and I said, okay, this is what I'm looking for in a doctor, a lawyer, I, I would be looking a lot more uh, carefully rather than just saying, oh, you're a doctor. Okay. Oh, you're a lawyer. It just means you graduated. It doesn't mean where you graduated or how well you think or how well you keep up. Some people are just leaders in their field. Do you ever get worn down by anything, John? Does, does, does anything demotivate you? Uh, is there anything that you feel you have to recover from if it happened? And this goes back to my a comment that, that life is hard. And so Personally, I've learned to temper my expectations, especially when it comes to business. When it comes to business, it, it really is a, it really is a question of just playing the odds and trying different things. If you're not born into wealth and opportunity, uh, you know, uh, life is even that much harder. So, what what wears you down? Does anything wear you down? Or, yeah, one thing that is uh, criticism. It can really take my legs out from under me when I feel like I have let somebody down that I've been really trying to help. Uh, like if, uh, it, I mean, it doesn't happen often, but you know, recently I had a situation where a uh, client uh, uh, was not just, they just were not having success. And in spite of really going above and beyond and getting no um, cooperation on their end, like providing the guidance, but they would not take the ball and run with it. And so I know clearly in my in this in this particular instance I'm I'm using as an example um, I'm not at fault I I like I'm I'm not at fault I went above and beyond I was passionate as I was with them as everyone else and that I'm very very confident that the guides I provided would have produced the results they were looking for but they chose to go their own way I should not feel bad about that but it really bothered me for days it really really bothered me that's some kind of weird wiring in my head. I, I would have liked to have got rid of that when I was a lot younger. Um, I'm always, I'm always surprised how, uh, how difficult it is for me not to be criticized. I've always looked at criticism as a way to get better, but I don't, I don't deal with it well. It reminds me uh, a little bit of the shock that I had uh, when I was a commercial collector for a major bank. And I was responsible for a fair-sized portfolio. And after a couple of years of doing that, it became clear to me, no question, that half of the commercial loans that went bad were setups. 
you know, these businessmen would, uh, they would start a business, borrow huge sums of money, pay themselves uh, huge uh, salaries and bonuses. And uh, over a course of a few years, they would let the business fail, but they would have escaped basically with hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's that kind of, of shock and <laughs> indignation and anger when you know that, you know, w- what the bank had done was in, in good faith mm-hmm. and they had been set up. You know, that's, that's, that's also one of the things I was getting at that, you know, when I was w- younger, I, I had too much respect for authority figures. I'll tell you, doing, doing that particular job uh, straightened my head out real quick. Yeah, that's, um, uh, I think, um, uh, more of an arm's length disappointment. I have those as, as, uh, as well, like in current events here. It's just like I read something the other day. Uh, well, you were you were you're on the you're on the direct receiving end. You you're receiving this from a, a customer, and so yes, I was an employee of the bank, but I still took it probably too personal. Once yeah. you once you realized what was going on, uh, it was very upsetting. I feel that I think in current events, with you know the way that people are uh, um, ignoring science uh, everywhere, we just have so many people there that either are suffering from ignorance or stupidity, and I think it's mostly ignorance, but I don't know, but they have heavily invested opinions that are just wrong, and you know, then they, they're the ones who call, well, you're a sheeple, and there's just no having a dialogue with them at all, mm-hmm. and that, mm-hmm. I find that particularly frustrating that I'm willing to listen and, and, and uh, get a sense of where they're getting their information, and then I can give it some weight, but there is no room for dialogue. None whatsoever. There, there's just basically tribalism. I've, that I find particularly uh, uh, upsetting and sad at, at this point, uh, from the, an arm's length perspective, where it's not me d- directly involved. Because you know I can choose not to interact with those people. But holy smokes, I find it's very difficult to connect with another person now. Uh, that there are so many people that I, I find just don't think critically. Right. People should listen to our podcast on uh, critical thinking and cognitive biases if they want uh, a little more information on what we think at any rate about those those particular things. It reminds me also that people believe in an interfering God. You know, I'm agnostic. I'm willing to acknowledge, acknowledge that, you know, we don't have all the answers when it comes to creation. But uh, it seems that this belief in an interfering God is, uh, is simply not supported by any evidence anywhere, anytime throughout history. Tell me, do you have a bucket list? Is, is there, are, are there any things that, you know, you're in your 60s now, uh, anything that you have planned that, that you really want to do? You know, there's yeah. a few, few places in the world that I would like to see. And, and I'm not talking about the, the standard places like, like Europe. I'm talking about some far out remote islands that I have uh, seen in various uh, BBC articles and other places. There's a lot of interesting, I I thought actually I'd like to put together some sort of a a tour schedule where you just go from these remote islands to another remote island. There's a lot of them around the world that where there's like places where you wouldn't think that people would actually live for an extended period of time, but there are people living on these little rocks out in the middle of the ocean. They've got their own communities. And I just think that that's one of my, it's one of the things that I have on my bucket list, as it were. I, I don't really have anything else that I can think of other than travel. I'd have to write it down. I'll tell you one that I definitely have is I want to go down to South America, probably Peru, and uh, take part in a legitimate ayahuasca ceremony uh, uh, that that's that's, that's a good one. Could, um, could you just clarify the pronunciation of that uh, for us what did you call it ayahuasca ayahuasca okay well, i'm i'm curious i what's what's that all about it's, it's like a psychotropic experience uh, where uh, there's a you, you really got to be careful now because it's become popular so there's all these places, uh, resorts down, not really resorts, but uh, uh, retreats was, is the right word. I shouldn't use that word. You you go down for a few days or a week uh, and uh, uh, you, you partake in uh, the ingestion of um, 
a mixture of plants that create a, it's sort of like an LSD experience, but it, it's ingrained in the culture there. And in fact, there are cultures all over the planet that have their own version of it. So you have peyote would be like in, in some of the southern states. And, uh, I've heard of that. Psilocybin uh, is through mushrooms and you've seen that in, in Europe and England and uh, different parts of the world because that's a, 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 a around. And ayahuasca is, is unique to that particular area. So it is, it's just, uh, uh, but the th one of the things that, well, one, this COVID's put all that stuff on hold. You can't yeah. I, I, I almost pulled the trigger last year to do it. You know, you've got all these new wave uh, nonsense uh, people who, like, you, I'd look up one of these retreats, and you, so you could go to partake, and they also have a course to be a shaman. How the hell can you take a course to be a shaman? If you haven't, like, been doing it for 40, 50 years, you're not a shaman. I don't care. So, like, I thought, well, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking yeah. for a version experience with somebody who's the real deal, not just trying to make money off a of crazy tourist like me. Is that kind of thing safe? Well, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, the uh, the U.S. government back in the '60s went crazy trying to convince everybody that it wasn't. It, it is uh, um, safer than alcohol. The experiences that I have had in the past, particularly with psilocybin, it is the equivalent of thirty years of therapy in three hours. And based on my own personal experience, ayahuasca is just another version of it, but apparently there's some things, uh, aspects that are unique. And uh, okay. I, I found the accounts of people. So as far as the danger, there have been some people who've had, it's backfired on. But again, uh, it's always the exception to the rule that comes to. Overall, if you just look at the overall numbers, I'm not worried about it even a little bit. Because I'll do my research before I, I do get... Uh, I, I get involved in it, but I, I would like to, uh, I'd like to try that. I will tell you that having had the experience, I don't think anyone on this planet, I think, I think everybody on this planet should do this once a year. And I don't think we should vote for anybody in government who hasn't done it. It's, it's, it's that, uh, it's that therapeutic. Is that the right word? And perspective. It actually just realigns your whole worldview in what I would say is uh, a much more realistic. It, it just gets you reconnected to, to, uh, to life. So um, how important is money to you? Uh, we can't, we can't get through a, a general philosophy discussion without at least mentioning, uh, mentioning money. I could care less. Like I just want enough to pay the bills and uh, that's fine. After that um, it's all bonus, you know? Uh, so yeah. It, the way to uh, keep score, like they say, but I, I'm not like possession oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, like I like my gadgets and, and stuff, but almost everything that I ever purchase is functional. Like it, it it's something that I'll have, it'll force me to learn a little bit from, um, stretch me out a little bit. When I haven't had it, I've missed it because sure. I know the pressures that are associated with that. So I'm not dismissing that i'm just saying once you get to the point that's why i wonder about this concept that they they're talking about is uh universal basic income is that the yes basis? the yeah, yeah. It's, it seems it's coming up more more frequently these days yeah I, i'd be very interested to find out how that would work out in the long run because i again i think that there is a significant and i've been there for a good part of my life of where you just you know, you're you're at the uh, the cashier for your groceries, and you just don't know, is there going to be enough in there, or you, you don't have enough money to buy your kid a donut. I get that, and I know the difference in being relaxed in that lineup, and not being relaxed, and that is a reflection of your entire day and your week and your year. And I think that will affect the way a lot of people uh, treat each other and perform in their lives elsewhere. Will will uh, will it uh, only appeal to our baser, greedy instincts? I don't know. I think that uh, once you get to a, a position where you're comfortable, it's uh, it's nice to have more money. But it's really all about you want the money so that you don't have the stress that comes with knowing that you need more. It's the challenge that you want to that makes life meaningful. I mean, once you have enough. I've always said that multi-billionaires don't eat better than I do, and they don't sleep in a more comfortable bed. I'm in a position now where I'm not anxious about money. 
generally speaking, life is good, which does not mean that I don't want more because I know with more money, I'll be able to, you know, help friends and relatives out and maybe make their life a little bit uh, less stressful. That's a good way to look at it is some people are better equipped to collect money. And if their attitude is to do so and redistribute it amongst, that would be a different world. I mean, that's, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett are really pushing is that, you know, those of, uh, in the world that are extremely wealthy have to find ways to put that money to use that benefits humanity. And, and apparently it is one hell of a challenge to do it. Bill Gates being interviewed uh, by a uh, rather obsequious guy. I, I, I didn't like to, I, I really was looking forward to listening because I know Bill Gates has been put under a lot of pressure right now uh, with all the conspiracy theorists. And it, it, it shocked me. And the, uh, the guy who was interviewed with him was overly concerned. He, he took away from the power of what Bill Gates had to say in this interview. But part of it was about this, about, you know, Sure, he's giving away his money, but it's he's making it faster than he can give it away without even trying. And he said, you get to a certain point in wealth, and that's the case. I I am certainly not in that position, but I understand that you get a little bit higher where you go, oh, yeah, of course, you do have more opportunities. You've got rid of all the stinking thinking that kept you from doing that sort of thing. And now you're able to do some once once you've taken care of yourself. And I think I think it is important that you do have to take care of yourself first. Yeah. And and then after you've taken care of yourself, then you can help others. So people who are, are very concerned about earning money just for themselves, you know, I don't hold that against them. That's that's fair game. So you're in your sixties, John. I'm in my sixties and uh we're not retired. And uh, frankly, I have no intentions of retiring. I actually like getting up and working. So how long are you going to keep this game going? The, the term retirement has never been in my vocabulary. I'm not saying that as a, like it was a, a conscious choice. It, I just never have been wired that way. Like it just never, like I, I've never uh, ever received a paycheck or take on a, take on a business project where I said, okay, this is help lead to my retirement. Who wrote the Travis McGee series? John D. McDonald. John D. McDonald. So yeah, I, I like what his idea where, you know, he would work, make some money, and then he'd take his retirement in installments. And I think that's the way people should do it. Why the heck would you wait until you, 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 you know, you can't uh, water ski or do all the physical things to do your retirement? I like that idea. Not that that's why I did it. It's just, I, I've never thought that way. And I've never really hung out with people who think that way. So it's kind of a foreign concept to me. Hey John, when you look back, what mistakes have you, have you made in life? Are there any, any particular big life mistakes you would say that you have made? Uh, speaking for myself, I, I would say, I think I regret, uh, and it may only be a small regret, but it's a regret, but I regret not not networking enough, not staying in touch with uh, friends and even acquaintances that I've met in the past. And I think, I think somehow business would probably have been easier uh, yeah. for me if I had. That, that's, that's a good point. I regret not making more friends. Now, and I, I, like as far as making and, and, and maintaining uh, friendships or been more approachable to become someone's friend, that would be uh, one thing. Uh, but you know what just what popped into my head? I mean, that's it's too broad a topic. Do you remember G. Gordon Liddy? Of course, yes. Yeah, so, I read his book. He, he wrote yeah. a couple of fiction books, too, and I think I read them. Yeah, they were bad. They were bad. I like that. <laughs> You're talking about his book, Will. Yeah. One of the things, I remember it. one of my regrets is in the uh, uh, relationships that I did see with uh, those of the opposite sex. Uh, as far as like when you're looking for like a long-term relationship is that it was, it's far too, because of our youth, hormonally driven. Do you remember G. Gordon Liddy saying that he selected his wife on the basis of her athletic ability and her intellect and that, that and the, the, the sexual attraction was part of it, but it was not the sole thing. And I think when we're young and stupid, we can talk ourselves into a lot of crap. Like, you know, it's an, I always tell people with they got these dogs is oh i got a dog and it comes from a show dog line and they're uh, who cares like they're, they're, it's just me this, that, that's fashion it's not function and i've dated very attractive people and they were as dumb as stumps 
but you don't want to uh, pass your genes on in that context. And it, it's part of the reason that, that I'm single now is like making the decision on who you're going to share your life with, I guess, w- whether it's, you know, just friends uh, or, uh, uh, you know, regardless of what you're attracted to for long-term relationships, I would have liked to have learned a lot more about, um, um, what it takes to have a successful relationship. And that just made me think of something else. Something I wished I'd known early in my life as far as relationships go is that uh, book, I can't remember the guy's name now, uh, The Five Languages of Love. Right, I've read it as well. Relationships is uh, you don't love a person, like you have to resist the urge to love a person the way you feel loved because not everybody takes that, those sorts of signals and, and sees it as the, an expression of love. You have to find out how they feel love. Uh, like this is a quick example. Some people, they just get tickled pink if you just give them a card or something. Some people, if you do something for them, you put up a shelf for them. They, feel, they see that as you must care about me. I wished I'd figured that out younger in life. For some people, it's, it's, it's just the way you speak. I think in the five languages, they call words of compassion or words of encouragement or something like that. And uh, for some people, it's time. It's the amount of time you devote to them. Some it's touch. So for some it's touch. Yes, I'll try and put a uh, I'll try and put a, a reference to that book uh, in the uh, in the comments on the website. Textbook in high school, if I had my way. Yeah, it's it's or one so. of the few bo- one of the few books that I think I would recommend as well. I was thinking about writing a book uh, for, uh, for for my line of work, and I just haven't figured out how to title it. But because it's the opposite part of it, so that's the five languages of love. I think that. Uh, I, I need to write a book on the five languages of no, or how many it might be, like on how to get across to somebody in as the least um, least offensive way as possible that the answer is no. Yeah. So <laughs> in a personal relationship or a business late relationship, I, I, may, I imagine there's some research there because the, as, as mysterious as it was with me when I had the revelation of, oh my God, there's five languages of love. I thought it was just the way I want to be loved. Doesn't everybody like that? Some people need to hear no in a certain way right. or resonate. Do you have a particular approach uh, to resolving conflicts, uh, either personally or in business? Uh, when, when somebody is in disagreement with you, uh, what would your, your modus operandi be? On a, on a personal relationship problem, mm-hmm. if I don't say no and I don't stand up and I just let it go. And then what inevitably happens, I hit this uh, critical mass and then I just cut them off. That's it. Yeah, I think I tend to be that way That's uh, not myself. myself. I, I, I think of myself, even even in, in business, you, you I just usually shut up and let somebody rant until it becomes too much to bear. And perhaps that's the wrong way of going about it. I, I'm not sure. That, that'd be a great life skill to, to learn. Yeah, I, I, I have another friend who uh, has told me, uh, and I think quite rightly, that uh, uh, people in marriages should uh, seek some sort of marriage counseling at least once a year, like a course. <laughs> that was me. I, I've <laughs> always thought that that should because. Even the courses that I, I think it was my sister saying when she and her, her husband, ex-husband uh, went to, they took a course, a uh, marital pre, it was, I think a premarital course and it uh-huh. was church. And they said they laughed themselves silly at some of the, as you said, sort of mysterious father from above type guidance, but in every single course, there's going to be some things that will help. I, I think that's got to be a proactive effort. Yeah, it, uh, it was my friend uh, Byron who mentioned that uh, to me. I actually want to get him on uh, for an interview on one of these podcasts. Uh, but uh, you know, failing you, my friend, it huh? was not Byron. I had that conversation with you several I, times. I can't remember whether uh, you or he has gone through more wives. It's just uh, eluded me. But. Uh, <laughs> okay, so you know, lo- life is hard and wish generally that people can deal with their problems and just keep on trucking and get through it. Is there anything else that you would, you would like to add to this particular uh, podcast? Not off the top of my head, but okay. that's, say there's not a ton that could be. Uh, there's a ton more that could be. Certainly. 
and, and many, many more. Okay, well, uh, next time uh, we'll discuss which royal has the best fashion sense, uh, Meghan or Kate. <laughs> All right, I may be sick for that one. Okay, we'll talk to you later then. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Check out their YouTube channel or go to www.twooldguystalking.com. See you next time.